with that said, let's jump straight in because there's a lot of content to get through and a lot of things I know you guys are excited to hear. And uh, Porter, I'll, I'll pass it to you and let you kind of jump into it. Yep, sounds great. Thanks, Tim. Oh, great sure. to be with you. Just got to get through the screen sharing. I made you host Porter, so good to go. Good to go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so you know, I'll give you about thirty minutes on the latest Web Focus release, which is release nine point two. Um, we, we generally follow a cadence of a major release every six months or so. You know, if you were to go back to when was 9.1 that was in november if you're going to go back to when was release 9 that was february 2022 so i think you can expect that there are of course smaller feature releases bug fix releases service packs and what have you in between so exciting to be um on the back end of that release it went production about two weeks ago um when, when we think about how do we spend our time in the product division, and I my title is product manager, they have me doing a bunch of stuff um, with the product roadmap and product management and product marketing as well. And as Tim said, been at IBI for a, a long time. <laughs> I joined out of college in 2000. It's been awesome. I love it. That's why I'm still here. So people always ask us, how do you decide what is on the roadmap and what to work on? And really, for the last two to three years, this has been the high-level themes, okay? So when you see what I'm going to show you today, and I'm not going to do like a demonstration or any slide work of the cloud, but we did introduce the container edition of Web Focus. We introduced multi-tenancy, auto-scaling. You can deploy Web Focus to the cloud, you know, instantly. Um, and so really nice capabilities there. We can follow up if anyone wants more interest, uh, more information on that. Um, but really what we've been hard at work on is it's really a balance between customer requests and then our market research and development division where we're thinking about what is the future of data and analytics? What are our customers going to need that we're not providing now? What is the market? Where does the market see it going? Um, how do we better serve the key personas within our accounts, which might be right now, you know, a, a BI or application developer? And then the end non-technical consumer, I always think of as our top two personas, but there's like business users and business analysts, where does data science fit into all of this? And so that's the balance of how we decide what to, we work on. And we have always been customer centric and we remain customer centric. And you'll see that in a lot of the things that we're working on around modern BI, which is making the designer, the single content creation tool and anything you could do in App Studio or Info Assist now is done in designer, but it's a much better user experience and workflow. It's functionally complete and there's additional capabilities in there that didn't exist in the other tools. And there's also, we're thinking about taking existing capabilities. We have like Reportcaster and modernizing it or knowing that people are looking to rebrand and white label content, make that more inside the box rather than like, you know, I've been working with customers that have been white labeling our content for, for over 10 years. And we're like in file directories, changing icons, and it can be a problem at upgrade time. And then they're just thinking about like new interfaces, like Web Focus Hub. And then integrated data science is a great example of our vision of the future. Like, you know, how can we automate repetit repetitive tasks? Um, how can we allow people to train models and make predictions? How can we do things like machine generated data stories and natural language query and all of these things? So that's a, you know, that's a quick look under the hood in terms of how we make these decisions. So that's all going to map into what I have to show you today. The first thing that I want to show you is white labeling. And what, what white labeling is, this is in, important in embedded BI deployments. It's in, important for anyone that's going to OEM or resell the application. And what white labeling is, is a little different than what many of our customers have been doing for a long time, which is just styling web focus reports and dashboards. Okay, so take a quick look at this portal, right? We can see that the menus and navigation are icons. They're not textual. There are containers. The containers have a certain look and appearance. 
the charts have certain series colors. If we were to look at um, the report, the report has a certain style. The controls have a certain style. This is what you've been able to control for a long time by either styling it manually or creating a new web focus style sheet or theme file. You've been able to do this for forever. Where white labeling is a little different is white labeling handles the look and appearance of web focus tools and interfaces beyond the report and the dashboard. So we're talking about the web focus designer would be a good example of a tool that somebody that's creating an embedded BI application, there might be a lot more than reports and dashboards, they might have a need, their users might have a need to create reports or dashboards. They want to offer that as part of the application, but they don't want something that looks totally different than the hosting application with IBI and web focus text everywhere. The user doesn't care that it's IBI or web focus. They just want to be able to create reports or dashboards. And so the value of white labeling web focus tools and interfaces is that you can add additional capabilities to your application, but it looks and feels exactly like that hosting application. It's your logos, your icons, and your colors as well. So the, some of the key areas beyond color palette that you might want to customize is a favicon, which is the icon you see up here. Um, maybe like headers and logos. So you can see that's the standard web focus designer header. Web focus reporting server where you would connect to new sources of data, modify metadata, create data preparation flows. And then the web focus hub and the web focus homepage, which are kind of simpler. And if you're not super familiar with the web focus hub, web focus hub was created for a number of reasons. First and foremost, new users of the product, friendly or start experience when I get here, access to the tools to connect to data, modify metadata, and create content. We're also exposing some of the new capabilities here like NLQ and machine-generated data stories. And it's in one place access to all of your data and content assets, whether you're a creator or just someone running it, whether you can search for the content, you can edit it, create, share, collaborate on the content. It's optimized for use on mobile devices. So that's why someone may want to white label the hub. If you need any of those capabilities, if you desire any of those capabilities in your application, that's where the hub could come into play. Let's take a look at some of this in action. Um, uh, you know, we've got a fictional company that's going to go through this exercise and I want to just customize everything. So the first area would be the favicon. And I've got a couple right here, okay? Now, when I click save, that will update immediately, but that updates only for me. As long as I'm clicking save, that update is just for me. I can get a look at what it's like. Doesn't get broadcast to anyone till I hit publish. Let's change some of the logos. So many times you might have a dark theme, okay? Like the Web Focus Hub has a dark header. Um, as well. So um, if I go to logos, what I'm looking for is the web focus hub with the white logo. There it is. World Class Enterprises is my fictional company for the purposes of this exercise. The web focus homepage is like a simplified version of the web focus hub. I'll show it to you after we white label it. So in this case, I'm looking for uh, the web focus hub header, but with a black logo. We can see that the reporting server. I've got, I'm looking for the black logo and the web focus designer. Let's look for the black logo. Okay, so we've changed all of our logos. Let's click save. Boom, I see it right there. See it update. But it's still showing IBI web focus hub. Oh my God, what's that? I don't even know what that is. So of course you might want to change ad labels as well. You call it whatever you want. So let's just do that real quick. WCE. So quickly change the logos and the tab labels. Now, the other big thing is obviously color palette, okay? So this is a look into really the web focus style guide. And I think you can, because you look at these colors, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's this blue 
the hover background is that blue the selected background is that blue this is you know this is what it looks like and then there's different options you know for things that are checked or if we want a vivid option or a muted option or text colors or paper colors or other or a primary gradient color that we want so you can absolutely come in here and manually change any of these things i'll just do this real quickly say i want to change the primary color of the text and let's take a look at the header as well it's going to show you a quick manual update of that okay so you can see how quickly that kind of changes the look and appearance of the web focus hub what you're going to find is that many large organizations they've got style guides they've got full-on user experience in design departments they've got standards around this they already exist so sometimes it might be useful to actually download a text file of all of these values. You can share this with UXD. They can put in the correct values. And then you can actually just upload a text file as well. So I've got one pre-built here called Burgundy and Black. And it will just update all of those values automatically. You can see how radically you can change the look and appearance right, of that application. All right, I'm ready to publish it. Everyone's going to get it. I click publish. Oh my God, I made a mistake. What do I do? Not a problem. You can reset to default anytime you want, or you're going through iterations. You can revert to last publish if you want. So you can see how that changes the look and appearance of the Web Focus Hub, uh, both here and then as I look across some of these interfaces. The Web Focus homepage, if you're curious what that is, it's really like a simplified view of the web focus hub some customers say i don't need everything that the hub does i just want you know the ability for people to run recent content and search for it and you know and, and then act, uh, access the tool so you can kind of see how that's what that is and that's how it affect that appearance um and then i'm not going to open up the web focus reporting server i think you you know kind of get the picture here it's any of the data related tools but i will show you the web focus designer okay so you can get a feel for i think you know if someone were going to look to white label components of web focus i think it's probably the hub and designer would be of most interest okay so i can just come in here and select a data file and then of course you know i think we would match this up right with a style sheet so that you know all of the series colors and maybe the styling of the report would kind of match this theme so that's what white labeling is. Um, and that's something that our uh, customers are doing embedded BI resellers, OEM clients have been doing custom um, that is now totally inside the box. You, you know, you want to upgrade the product, not a problem. Everything is kind of stored in the right place. Um, and you've got no concern about images or settings and files that might have been never had been intended to be changed. Um, but that we did get in there and change for customers who was important too, because our customers have been white labeling web focus, you know, in a more kind of custom manual uh, format for years. So I am going to reset to default. Okay. Takes me right back. Next thing that I want to look at is um, something from the more market research end of the product which is the work we're doing around DSML. And there's a lot that we're doing around DSML. This new feature that we're introducing in 9.2 is called DSML explainability. And the thinking behind explainability is that if you're gonna create a model, whether that be a binary classifier or anomaly detection or clustering or whatever it might be. And by the way, I'm gonna give you kind of like the business users or business analysts perspective on data science within Web Focus. If you're not, we have an actual data scientist, Aiden, on the line, who will give you the data scientist expert late, uh, uh, opinion later. So what we find is that if someone's going to create a model that makes a prediction of some kind, we think this is an anomalous transaction. We expect this customer to churn. A lot of people don't want that to be a black box. They want to understand why did the model make that prediction. So DSML explainability will help you understand that. It's an extension of a capability we introduced in release nine and extended in release 9.1 called machine learning functions. So a quick review of this since it's related. Machine learning functions would from within a data preparation flow, 
So you've got a data set, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can leverage these types of algorithms that we see on the left right here to actually train a model within Web Focus. Okay, so if you're looking at anomaly detection, you know, a, a you're going to get what's most appropriate based on the model. A histogram would be appropriate, and it's identifying, you know, the three percent of transactions that it thinks is anomalous. As I go through here, there's you know a lot of different settings. It's graphical. It's intended to you know not require a data scientist, <coughs> excuse me, to use it. Okay, and you're, you'll notice what we're doing is it's giving a confidence or probability that each transaction is anomalous. That's a good example of the anomaly detection algorithm. All graphical interfaces, as we transition to maybe a binary classifier, we're saying, hey, let's use 80% of the data to test, uh, to train, 20% to test, number of trees, what's the positive class. We're using really the most popular common machine learning models. We're giving you a good idea of how these things are calculated and describing it. And then you can see F1 score um, is a pretty good high level metric for the accuracy of a model. If you like one, you say the extreme gradient boosting model is the best at predicting customer churn, you can save that. And then you can map it to new data using a machine learning function. Uh, sorry, a web focus function, okay? And so this is what it looks like to save it, okay? And then, you know, if we're looking at a binary classifier, you're going to see things like confusion matrices, ROC curves, precision recall curves. Aiden will be on later to demystify with some of these things, mean and the use cases that they support as well, okay? So, and that's the regression one, okay? So quick overview of machine learning functions. Now, the idea here is that once you have deployed the model, you want to understand why the model's making the prediction as it is. So I've got a little video here to show the DSML explainability, right? So this is taking, let me fast forward this a little bit. This is taking, we've already trained a model and saved it right here. This is my current data of bank customers. I want to take that saved model, let's say it was extreme gradient boosting, and I want to map it to this data using a web focus function. Now, once I've done that, we are scoring the new data for probability of churn or of existing customers. If I find one with a high value, you can now click on any value and it takes you into the explainability dashboard. What it's showing you is how did we, how did the model arrive at this prediction of an 89% probability of churn? So the impact plot on the le left is feature importances. The width of the bar is going to show you the increase or the percentage or the importance of that variable. So it's saying total transaction count and total transaction amount were the two most important variables in making this prediction. That's the width of the bar. The color of the bar is telling you whether the value is very low or very high or somewhere in between. So you can see transaction count was a big contributor because the actual number of transactions was very low, only 16 when the average is 64 and the range is much higher. Likewise, the total transaction amount was very low, 692 and the average is much higher. What's really cool is we built in what if analysis. So you can actually say, hey, if the total transaction account was actually the average, how would that affect the model's prediction in terms of probability of churn? So if we click recompute model outcome, you'll actually see it would dramatically drop that probability. And this, this is what's happening every time someone applies for a loan. There's a model in the background that is predicting the probability of default. And that's why you get approved or you get denied or they decide in the interest rate that you get, okay? So the DSML explainability, I think, is, is super cool um, and a great extension onto the machine learning functions capability. More on that later from Aiden. Now, um, other important areas we've been working on. Hold on, too many tabs open. 
So another big area that we've been working on yesterday when I did this, this my designer was kind of frozen. So I'm just gonna refresh it to make sure we're good to go here. You know, a huge area that we've been working on has always been a web-focused designer, okay? We know that that's super important to our customers. We want the web-focused designer to be your one-stop shop to create everything. And it's like so close to doing everything that App Studio or InfoSyst ever did and more. Um, the biggest new capability that we added to the web-focused designer in 9.2 is critically important for anyone creating operational reports, dashboards, or applications. And that's a new capability around filtering. It's called compound filtering. Let me give you a good example of what that is. So I'm going to create a quick chart here. It's going to look at revenue by month. And we're going to use the color attribute by product category. What happens a lot is that people create combinations of filtering criteria, and there may be conflicts with what to do. Display all data, display no data. And it all comes down to whether you're using an and or an or operator through multiple filter conditions. The default designer is and. You can run into problems with that. Let me show you a good example of when you might. So let's create a filter uh, product category. And I want accessories, computers, and stereo systems. Note, I am not selecting media player. This does what I would expect it to do. It filters to those three product categories. Well, if I were to add a second condition, Looking at a subcategory in, of just these two subcategories, DVD players that actually exist in the media players category, what's going to happen here? Is it going to show all the data? Is it, is it going to be actually a conflicting condition? And it is a conflicting condition when the operator is an ant with the two. So we added the edit filter expression. We can add a group. We can drag the two filter criteria down into the group and change it from an and to an or. And now what we're getting is we're not getting every subcategory within media players. We're getting just those two that we selected that you can see right there. So we know that's a big request uh, for the customer, something that you could do in InfoSys and App Studio before, and it is now in App Studio. A um, couple other small things in the web focus designer an additional output format of CSV. As I go to the output format settings here, we'll just see it can be with headers, without headers. We've also got tab separated values as well. Another thing that we added as I go back to HTML is if you've got a really long report, of course you want to freeze the column titles. Okay, right, so frozen column titles in HTML tables now as well. So those are a couple things within designer. Another one that I like a lot is, you know, we've been doing so much work around geospatial in designer. Let's see, do I have this in my recents? I don't think I do. So let's go into workspaces and I'm going to load up the bin visualization. As you might be aware, in release nine, we introduced multiple map layers available within the designer multiple data layers, whether those are proportional symbol or point layers or line layers, or choropleth color filled layers, demographic data layers, you can activate as many as you want. We exposed many more of the default settings of this as well within the designer. Um, and since then, we've also been adding a lot of, you know, in 9.1, there was a lot of like, uh, you know, route planning and drive, drive time analysis. I don't think I need my VPN on here. I'll just make sure this loads. And if it doesn't, I'll turn on my VPN. We're good. Okay. One of the other things it bought you was a much more modern map viewer. It's got search, got really nice selection controls. And a lot of the things that you can do within the data layer, super cool. Okay, so in 9.1, we actually reviewed what layer effects and feature effects do. It allows you to apply filter conditions and then apply styling or effect conditions that highlight or de-emphasize cohorts of interest on the map. The other thing that was added, and this is looking at um, 
the address of customers and it's coloring the dot based on the amount of revenue that they've spent. So a couple things that were added in 9.1 that I think are, are very cool. Anyone that's created a scatter plot with a lot of dots that are overlapping each other knows the problem of communicating and understanding things like density or clustering. Um, and so density and clustering introduced in 9.1 really help you solve that problem where there might be hundreds of dots that overlap each other you wouldn't know unless you do density or clustering, you wouldn't understand that. Um, likewise with clustering, this is something that I like where it looks at it and based on the proximity, it will group it into logical clusters. Okay, and so BIN is similar to both of these, but it is a really nice visualization technique. If you're familiar with scatter plots, you might be familiar with something called a hex bin scatter, which groups the dots into boxes and then colors the box based on the metric value or the total count of the values. And that's what the bin visualization does here as I zoom out. Now you notice this, it's a small number of bins, okay, but it is coloring it based on total number of customers or it could color it based on the metric. And I can adjust the bin level. Let's actually make it, okay. You might actually have seen a map like this of the United States around election time on, you know, Nate Silver's 538 site or the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. It's a pretty popular um, uh, kind of like infographic display um, that you see a lot of times on maps. And this helps me understand where the density of all of these exists. So the bin was something that we introduced in 9.2 as well. Now, lastly, but not least importantly, more enhancements to document mode of designer. The document mode of designer is pixel perfect, uh, released, uh, introduced in release nine, further enhanced in, in release nine, what we introduced was, you know, the ability to drop um, charts and reports onto the page, size them. Um, you have the ability to add images as well. What we introduced in 9.1 was multiple output formats. So active HTML. PDF, PowerPoint, and HTML. And then what we introduced in 9.2 is we inch closer and closer to functional completeness as text boxes. So um, I can just add a, you know, I'll add a heading here and complete control over things like uh, the format and the style, page size, multiple pages we've had for a couple of releases. Other things that we know are on this list are things like overflow settings, Tables of uh, table of contents, um, things like the ability to drop controls on the page if it's an active HTML document as well. Um, so in a nutshell, in about 30 minutes, those are some of the, I think, really interesting new capabilities within the designer that are, that are absolutely, I would say, weighted more heavily towards customer requests, but also... Um, you know, we're also thinking about with ML functions and DSML explainability, we're thinking about how can we be that one-stop shop where you can take, you got to have a journey that goes from data to model to insight, no, data to insight to model to action, okay? Aiden's laughing. It's like, that's that's exactly how a business user would talk about it. Or maybe he's saying, God, Porter does a really good job of pretending to be a data scientist. I'm going to choose to go with the latter and hand it off to... Uh, my good friend, Aiden Ellesmere. Thank you.